again, because those countries have shown that they can actively abuse their status of holders of reserve currencies for the sake of their political agendas in violation of all the fundamentals of free market trade and principles of the World Trade Organization. For quite a long time since the establishment of the BRICS Development Bank, we've been working on a project within the BRICS Five on reserve currencies, which is the forebearer of the steps we're going to take now. Towards facilitating the use of national currencies and most importantly, forming an alternative payment system. And the details of how it's going to look is up to ministers of finance and chairpersons of central banks. They will form a work group and prepare recommendations for state leaders for the next summit in Kazan. The discussion was well, pretty intense. I can't say it went absolutely smoothly, but we could see each state's commitment towards making decisions in all areas and criteria for procedures approved for partner countries were taken into account, but First of all, we were looking at the weight and importance just of that candidate country and its positions on the international arena, because everybody is in favor of working with similar-minded countries, believing in multipolar world, having the same way of thinking and committed to increasing the role of, of the Global South decision-making. And in this respect, the six countries that were mentioned today will be taken part fully in the BRICS operations since January the 1st. They fully meet those criteria. That's Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Argentina, Ethiopia, Iran and Algier. And the Arabic Republic of Egypt, I'm sorry. All of them were committed to joining the group. So six bids were accepted. And the reason for such explosive growth of BRICS, I think it lies in the fact that countries who want to get closer to the BRICS they realize the profound reasons for the processes taking place in the international arena. Those processes have revealed the West's intention to retain its hegemony at any price. They realize that the West is pursuing its agenda using any means, including the war against the Russian Federation. And all this manifested clearly during the discussion and during our talks with countries present today in Johannesburg. This hegemonism is global, and everybody realizes that the United States' goal is to punish Russia using the Nazi Ukrainian regime and to eliminate any alternative thinking on the international arena. Just look at Africa, look at the Americans courting African countries with the law they passed just recently, last year, 
It is called combating Russia's evil activities in Africa. Even before it was passed in the Senate, the Africans raised their voice in indignation against such an attitude. And now they are thinking about changing the wording in the House of Representatives, but the letter will remain the same. The spirit will remain the same. You know, they're making a, the Americans are making a resolution regarding countries to the south of the Sahel. Of course, all they're doing is aimed at people who don't know much about history of Africa. But this is obvious that this is yet another insult to African countries. Their rights as sovereign partners are simply being ignored. And last fall, there were sessions of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And Mrs. Yevon, Secretary of Finance, U.S. Secretary of Finance, said to African countries that you must remember who is giving you money. Without any diplomatic intricacies, she just put it very bluntly. And if we remember a very recent event, the Interparliamentary Pan African Assembly with the President of Kenya talked in public how Americans and their close allies demand from African countries to accept invitations to events supported by the West and ignore invitations to events held by the Russian Federation. It's all obvious, and no decent country will tolerate such an attitude. And while many think it is hard to to withstand such pressure individually, and BRICS can provide this main, mainstay for the multipolar world. That follows the trends of the global development, and BRICS is, of course, one of the strongholds and mainstays of what is going to be a multipolar world. Relying on the terms of the UN Charter and not in their current understanding, but in their completeness and interrelations with the, with the principle of the United Nations. Everybody voted for retaining the, the name BRICS, it has become a brand. And no candidate country has, has suggested to change it in any ways. It's going to emphasize the consistency of our organization. Well, that's a large question that warrants a lecture. I'll try to be concise. And as for prospects of the West turning towards common sense, well, can't judge here. Figures that are currently leading Western governments in have been very well, consistent under the, the leadership of Washington. They have shown such commitment to the American agenda 
even to the detriment of their own economies and their own people, I mean, European countries. It's a highly ideologized group of countries that, as President Putin once put it, think that they can substitute God Almighty. Well, sometimes we see in our conversations there is not a glimpse of common sense there telling us that we must, that we have to do something, but it's not the case when we can expect to convey our point of view through a dialogue. And we do not expect ourselves to be heard even. We're always in favor of dialogue. But we're not going to respond to ultimatums and threats. So if common sense doesn't prevail, well, they themselves say that we must defeat Russia on the battlefield to deal a strategic defeat. Well, go figure what they have now in, in place of common sense now. So this is where we are going to. This is where we're going to interact now, obviously, not on the diplomatic field, not on the diplomatic arena, but on the battlefield. And they, they know perfectly, although they are not allowed to say that, you know, they know very well what we are fighting for there. President Putin said that once again, at the BRICS summit, we're fighting for our security, for the interests of the people who want to speak in Russian, to teach their children in Russian, to use the fruits of the Russian culture on lands that their ancestors had been working on for hundreds of years. And as for democratization of the UN, we have long been talking about the need to reform the United Nations. Many innovations have been made already over the last 15 years, maybe more. Different commissions established. On matters of climate, matters of artificial intelligence, high technology. A lot has been done towards making the United States adapt to the development of the world and development of technologies. But the key matter of the reforms deals directly with your question is the reform of the Security Council, because Security Council symbolizes the UN in the eyes of the vast majority of people, and it has the powers that nothing else has, including matters of war and peace, matters of preventive measures like sanctions, and of course, when we're speaking about justice, in fair democracy, we can't put up the fact that out of 15 member countries, six belong to the United States camp, completely subdued to their will. We discussed that yesterday, and there's a paragraph in our statement that confirms the commitment of BRICS countries to reformation of the UN Security Council in the interest of better representation of developing countries, including India, Brazil, and the South African Republic, as a state whose active role in the United States will be strengthened also in the Security Council. Council reform in the provisions that are related to the membership, including the permanent members. We explained that the other 
candidates for permanent seats. After all, India and Brazil have long officially applied for permanent seats, and together with them, Germany and Japan also applied. The group of four, as that it is called, and they have converging interests, um, but only on the surface of it. If you look at the gist of the matter, you cannot accept the Germany or Japan becoming permanent members of the UN Security Council because this would make injustice even deeper uh, considering the current lineup. Most of the countries represent now the golden billion and the other 8 billion people living on this planet are not represented. So Germany and Japan would not add any value to the discussions within the UN Security Council because all they do is follow the instructions they get from the United States. So very rarely do we see any discordant voices within the UN Security Council on behalf of these countries that support the United States. So probably the decision that was announced today during the press conference will help us better coordinate our actions within BRICS. And BRICS holds regular events. And during the UN General Assembly in September, we hold ministerial meetings. And we will not wait until January 1st, 2024, and even before that, as Russia, as the next BRICS chair, will work with all the 11 countries. So this is like a football team, a soccer team. We'll make sure that all the 11 countries are well aware of the priorities of the Russian chairmanship in the BRICS, and the president has already highlighted and the Russian priorities that will follow up on the decisions that were reached as part of South Africa's. Van Prozor of Channel One, uh, about the chair uh, presidency of Russia in BRICS. So summit is going to take place in Kazan. So we were wish good luck in this final statement. So are we ready? And what will be our presidency about? And what do we want to do? If you follow uh, what we do over the last 20 years, it means that we are ready for anything. And the president talked about the priorities that we are going to promote. Uh, first of all, there is some transition obligations, for example, the economic partnership strategy within BRICS that is going to last until the end of 2025, and there is a, such a document that is called Innovation Cooperation Plan that will be over late 2024, so the presiding country have to implement all the projects that have already been adopted. We have a plan of innovation cooperation. And during COVID uh, pandemic, we have established organizations to mitigate infectious diseases. We have established joint center on researching the virus and many other things. So healthcare, considering that we are one of the leaders in this area, we are going to make it one of our priorities. Business Council will continue its activities. The Women's Business Alliance that was established at the initiative of Russia, contacts between scientists, youth forum, contacts between artists, contacts in education. There is a Network Briggs University, and under our presidency, we plan some events at the level of the higher education institutions of all five countries. I guess next year it will be 11 countries. And uh, obviously, energy, of course, energy matters for a long time. At our initiative, we have established the platform of energy research. It's been working well. It has a lot of useful information. And now when we are joined by such 
uh, powerhouses at, of the energy market like Saudi Arabia, Iran, United Arab Emirates. Of course, the topic of, the, of energy is going to become even more prominent and it will be very much in demand. So, luck is a, something you always need, of course, but I can guarantee you that we are going to have this luck. Question from Commerçant. Mr. Lavrov, before the summit, some media said that expanding BRICS would be a moral victory for Moscow and Beijing, and uh, the clout of the alliance will be increased, certainly. But what about the relative weight of Russia, considering the fact that the New Development Bank uh, declined some of the projects uh, to invest in Russia? Well, the Russia's uh, weight is not determined by what the New Development Bank decides, but the decisions to freeze investment of uh, projects in, in the Russian Federation that have been already approved, they're not legitimate. And the previous leaders of the bank stepped beyond their mandate and distorted the statutory aims of the bank. And the new president, Dilma Rousseff, fully understands the statutory mandate to develop banking relations and to develop financing arrangements for industrial and other projects for the benefit of the bank's members, regardless of the artificial barriers created by international monetary and currency institutions guided by the United States. So, as I've said, there are some arrangement to start work on alternative payment systems, and uh, it will also be a contribution to the effective work of the New Development Bank. So, I wouldn't say that someone's uh, relative weight is uh, changing, because a relative weight of a country could be seen from a country's presence at the United Nations. You could measure how many uh, staff it has in the Secretariat and other parameters, but unlike the West-centric stru structures where the United States uh, play the leading role, uh, BRICS is a different di is a different alliance because uh, those uh, West-centric institutions are always dominated by the United States, and we discussed that at the closed BRICS meeting yesterday. And when I was answering the previous question, I spoke about the explosive interest to adjoining BRICS, and uh, we have a different structure. We have equal footing for all participants. And if someone is uh, not happy with a decision, there will be no consensus. If someone is not comfortable with something, the search for acceptable wording will continue because we must ensure unity. We must achieve consensus instead of just doing uh, the bidding of uh, the leader of the pack. And these multilateral arrangements are much more sustainable and long-term and productive. And uh, I think this has already been mentioned as well. Uh, before the summit, I uh, saw some uh, Western TV channels announce the BRICS, BRICS summit, explaining that BRICS is an economic club of sorts. Well, economy is an important part of uh, BRICS, considering the fact that the five countries are uh, ahead of uh, the G7 in terms of their GDP. Uh, 
by purchase power parity, and with the new members it will be even more. But this means that our ministries of finance and energy and transport ministries have a lot of work on their hands uh, going forward. And uh, when President Putin pr proposed uh, his initiatives, he based that on an analysis of logistics and transport uh, systems. And uh, as you know, that's now a priority with uh, the new North-South Transport Corridor. And uh, it has been shown that taken together with the Northern Sea Route, these corridors expand the potential for economic growth for Eurasian countries greatly. And as countries in the Middle East and in the Persian Gulf join in, the potential of logistics projects increases even further. So a transport commission is proposed at BRICS and I think it's something we will do during our chairmanship. And uh, similarly, everyone supported Prime Minister Modi's proposal to establish a space exploration commission. We all congratulated our Indian friends with uh, the great achievements of the launch of the spacecraft to the other side of the moon, where uh, and no uh, spacecraft has uh, landed uh, before. No man-made apparatus ever touched down on that side. So I think this is very pro promising, as is energy. So the economic potential is great, but to say that BRICS is just an economic club is trying to diminish its real significance. And that can be seen in the political declaration, where our demands to democratize international relations are spelled out clearly, and to increase the role of the Global South in global governance mechanisms. It also stipulates that we will abide by international law and the UN Charter in full and in the interrelation with all the norms and principles enshrined in the UN Charter. And uh, the, uh, the reform of the U United Nations Security Council should be to the benefit of the developing countries of uh, Africa, Asia and Latin America. So, um, in addition to promoting the Security Council reforms, BRICS will continue its coordin co coordinating role in establishing uh, fairer arrangements at Bretton Woods institutions, including the IMF and the World Bank, and the WTO for that matter. So this fast-paced expansion, this energetic expansion, is significant, and the decision that we will identify new groups of partners it's uh, the result of BRICS's approach to political problems and uh, a vision of the future international relations, a vision that is based on promoting objective trends towards multipolarity. We see centers of growth and centers of power and influence which are not, which are not happy with just following the orders of the West, which still sticks to its colonial manners, trying to live off its colonial heritage. African leaders in St. Petersburg said that they don't need food supplies, they need technology. They need to have the capacity to grow grain and process it productively. And the same can be said about many other sectors. Uh, the president of Uganda said that the world coffee market is about $450 billion or even more. And the producer countries, those that supply the cocoa beans, receive only $25 billion. $400 billion and 
25 billion dollars all the african countries taken together receive less than three billion dollars for these coffee beans while germany which sells the processed product received 75 billion dollars that is double double the amount that africa receives as a whole so this is what we spoke about at the summit we lifted these discussions to a new level because we're discussing equity because you cannot live at the expense of developing countries resources the africans remember the colonial times very well and what they fought for and when they finally achieved independence they're seeing that there's an attempt to exploit their resources and to usurp all the added value it's something the West is trying to do and the Africans are not happy with it and now is a turning point we're speaking about it a turn towards multipolarity and this process cannot be stopped because it's an objective historic process So, Mr. Lavrov, considering that the number of new BRICS members includes oil-producing countries, has Russia proposed any energy unions with BRICS? If yes, have uh, relevant orders been given to work groups? Well, as I said, there are structures within BRICS that do with, deal with matters of energy and then we will look at relevant initiatives and if those initiatives are supported then we will support them as well so question from his vestia newspaper in his speech before the BRICS council Vladimir putin said russia may return to the grain deal if all terms are satisfied are there any signs of the west fulfilling the conditions. No, there haven't been any signs. The West only calls for us to support UN propositions. And today I'm meeting with the UN Secretary General, I'm going to raise this as well. But all propositions that have been offered many times in May and in June. They mostly call upon us not to revoke our agreement with the Ukrainian part of the deal. Let's add a couple of seaports, let's make more inspections. And if, if you do so, then we will start talking about maybe adding you to SWIFT in, a, in, in three months, say. And then we will try to convince insurance company not to raise their insurance premiums, insurance rates. Russia cannot accept any of those terms because we have been treated with promises for more than a year already. And as for other matters related to our connections with the West, relations with the West, there have been lots of empty promises, none of them were delivered upon. Just one example of a matter that seems so easy to settle. Russian fertilizers seized in a seaport, in an EU seaport, 260,000 tons. And the company that owns those fertilizers has already declared that we're giving them for free to developing countries. And President Putin called upon European countries to give us an opportunity to deliver those fertilizers to their destinations for free on our own expense. But out of 260,000 tons, the first batch of 20,000 tons, with huge difficulties, with five months of red tape and approvals, went to Malawi. 
Причем это не очень, наверное, хорошо для качества удобрения. And the rest of those fertilizers are still lying there in the seaport, which is obviously bad for their their quality. So this is what the West's promises are worth, even when we are ready to provide the fertilizers to developing countries for free. And as Vladimir Putin said once again, as soon as everything we've been promised is done, that very hour we will be ready to uphold our end of the grain deal. We signed to this deal to both of its parts, both of its halves. So, Mr. Lavrov, we've been in Africa for three days. Have you talked to any one of your BRICS and African counterparts about the situation in Niger? No, we haven't specifically discussed the situation. ECOWAS is dealing with it, but not in full membership, because ECOWAS is in favor of intervention. The West loves pulling things out of context, and explaining things the way they need it without looking at the background or any other factors. The sub-Sahel zone Africa, has been suffering from terrorism since 2011, when NATO picked apart Libya, ruined Libya, supporting terrorists who were fighting against Gaddafi. And when Libya ceased to exist, it became a black hole through which millions of illegal migrants flew, flowed to the north. And now the guerrillas that the West used to overthrow Muammar Gaddafi and the France by the, by the way, the French, who had been actively supporting opposition to Gaddafi, they are now withdrawing from Mali, withdrawing from the European Union mission. And those coups, we need to see the real reasons for them. And if we look at what Africa gets from cooperating with the West, the added value is taken away from the African continent. And Russia and Soviet Union did quite the opposite. We were trying to add value, contributing to healthcare and education in Africa. Now we see coups in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso. Well, I haven't looked deep into that, but when a certain part of the society sees that the system of relationships with the West, that the rulers of that country have built and are satisfied with personally, but when that system doesn't help solve the problems of the entire population, then we can't rule out those factors. I don't think an intervention will do any good to anyone, and a part of ECOWAS is forming of forming a force to combat that intrusion. I wouldn't wish such a scenario for Africans. It's going to be devastating for thousands and thousands of people. So, Mr. Lavrov, recently the President of France said he was ready to talk to President Putin. 
do you think he was going to go to Moscow and he couldn't actually he couldn't get to the BRICS summit? And do you think when such a dialogue could be beneficial to Russia? Well, I don't keep track of statements of who is going to do what in relation to Russia. But if one is interested in, in, in doing something, then elementary decency in diplomatic protocol requires to convey this interest using diplomatic channels, be it a meeting, conversation or anything else. And when readiness to return Russia to the civilized community is declared publicly, we are continuing the dialogue. I honestly have stopped paying attention to such statements. If you are saying this publicly, then you are catering to the audience that is listening to you. But it's unclear what signals they are trying to convey with such statements. Mr. Lavrov, continuing to speak about the President of France, he said once again that France, France cannot admit the defeat of Ukraine and France is ready to continue supplying long-range missiles. Yet at the same time, Macron says he's ready to talk to the Russian president about ending the conflict. So what do you think of such contradictory statements? Well, I've already touched upon this subject. I think that if anybody wants to contribute to finding ways of settling the situation, then it's usually done using relevant diplomatic channels. Instead of making loud, loud statements to intermediaries uh, providing about supplying Ukraine with long-range missiles probably used against targets in Russia, well, knowing what is going on in, in Europe now, well, they probably need to remind the international community about themselves to demonstrate how they are how they are active. Well, I can only be guessing here. But previously, Mr. Macron used to be the guarantor and liaison in Minsk agreements. And despite those Minsk agreements have been being ratified by the UN Security Council, they just needed it to, to win some time. It's the same as Mr. Alan said, but he was a liaison. On the threshold of the Johannes, Johannesburg summit, how would you characterize the current level of relationships between Moscow and Pretoria? This year, there have been two visits from Pretoria to the Russian Federation, first time in June. And the second time was when President Ramaphosa came to Russia. And there were very beneficial and trustful negotiations. On many areas such as uh, healthcare, education, sports, technologies, cultural ties.
Probably all African republics remember the role that the Soviet Union played back then. Pay special attention to spheres of material cooperation, and there is no doubt we have great prospects in this regard. You know, these demonstrations, there were some attempts after what happened in Niger, in Niger, and there were attempts to blame Russia for engineering this government coup. But very quickly, even in the leading Western countries, the officials said that they have no evidence to prove this point. The fact that there were Russian flags flying in this country, this primarily points to the fact and reflects Afrique Media, le monde, c'est nous.